Good morning, everyone. I hope that uh, you are all doing well. Um, today we're looking at the life and the work of Herman Melville, perhaps best known for his novel Moby Dick. We are reading one of his finest short stories, Bartleby the Scrivener, and in Bartleby we will meet one of the most famous nonconformists in American literature. Melville's father was a New York City merchant who, when he died suddenly, left his family heavily in debt. Melville was only 12 at the time, and he was forced to leave school and go to work. After a variety of jobs in his teens, Melville joined a whaler ship for the South Seas in 1841. And on that trip, Melville and a crewmate jumped ship and lived for several weeks with a native tribe. Upon his return to America, Melville transformed that experience into his first novel, Typee, a popular adventure tale that established him as a literary celebrity. Sequels would soon follow, a novel called Amu, but Melville's appeal was dampened by his more philosophical works, such as Mardi, Pierre, and then the work for which he is best known, Moby Dick, in 1851. Unlike so many of his contemporaries, Melville was not formally educated. Again, he dropped out of school at age 12. He proclaimed once that the whale ship was my Yale College and my Harvard. What Melville experienced at sea, in the exotic ports of call around the world, and on islands, shaped his life and his writing. He was extraordinarily prolific writing seven novels in the eight years spanning 1845 to 1852. With his first five novels, Melville found a genre that he was comfortable working in, the adventure tale set in exotic locations on the high seas. So these were sea-going adventures. And while Moby Dick certainly is a sea-going adventure, the novel that came out in 1851 called Moby Dick, Moby Dick was fundamentally different than the novels that preceded it, which caused great consternation to readers and to critics and subsequent reviews. It was during this time that Melville became great friends with Nathaniel Hawthorne. And in fact, Moby Dick is dedicated to Hawthorne. And Melville worked feverishly on the novel, which only sold about 3,000 copies. Moby Dick, the novel, really did not become a classic until it was re-examined around 1920. And in fact, We'll talk more about this in a few slides, but Melville sort of fell into a relative obscurity, and it really wasn't until the 1930s when the first academic uh, scholarly dissertation was written on Herman Melville's work. Critics of Melville's novels declared that they were in part unbalanced and that Melville had to struggle to regain the economic and critical popularity that he had enjoyed with his earlier novels. After Pierre, he primarily wrote short stories for magazines like Harper's. Financial concerns burdened the family for years, but an inheritance late in life allowed Melville to work on his final masterpiece, Billy Budd, Sailor. Only after his death did Melville rise from the ranks of second-rate adventure novelist to his present status as one of the most important American writers. Although Melville is mostly known and regarded for his 
prose fiction. He also wrote poetry and a fine collection of Civil War poems called Battle Pieces and Other Aspects of the War were published in 1866. He settled for a while as a customs inspector in New York in 1866. He toured Europe, Egypt, the Holy Lands. Um, other collections of poems were issued before his death. Melville died of a heart attack in 1891. Uh, and again, when he died, he died in relative obscurity. Today, though, it's hard to imagine American literature without him. It's hard to believe, but for 20 years before his death, Melville was a forgotten man. This is best reflected if we look at a couple of the obituary notices upon his death. Quote, he won considerable fame as an author by the publication of a book in 1847. Actually, it was 1846, entitled Typee. This was his best work, although he has since written a number of other stories, which were published more for private than public circulation. During the 10 years subsequent to the publication of this book, he was employed at the New York Custom House. This from the New York Daily Tribune, September 29, 1891. It's hard to imagine uh, here a uh, obituary for Melville not mentioning the book for which he is best known, isn't it? Moby Dick. Uh, here's another obituary, uh, one that is perhaps uh, harder for us to imagine. Uh, of late years, Mr. Melville, probably because he had ceased his literary activity, has fallen into a literary decline, as a result of which his books are little known. Probably, if the truth were known, even his own generation has long thought him dead. So quiet have been the later years of his life. Wow, that's a pretty, uh, a pretty harsh uh, assessment uh, of Melville's uh, later years, isn't it? to be thought already dead long before you are dead. As I mentioned uh, a few uh, slides ago, Melville and Hawthorne were intimate friends for a brief time in the early 1850s. Both men were living in Western Massachusetts. Uh, the passages that we'll see on the next two slides come from Hawthorne's journal entry from 1856. If you recall, when we were studying Hawthorne, Hawthorne for a while was working at, uh, and living in Liverpool, England. Uh, he had that, uh, uh, um, that kind of cushy appointed government job that uh, his buddy Franklin Pierce, the president, had given him. And Melville comes to Liverpool, England to visit his uh, American friend, Nathaniel Hawthorne and Sophia. Uh, what portrait, this is my question, what portrait of Melville emerges from the passages uh, that we have from Hawthorne's journal where he recollects the meeting with Melville? These passages are from Nathaniel Hawthorne's recollection from the time spent with a visit from Herman Melville. Melville has not been well of late. He has been affected with neuralgic complaints in his head and limbs, and no doubt has suffered from too constant literary occupation, pursued without much success latterly, and his writings for a long while past have indicated a morbid state of mind. Melville as he always does, began to reason of providence and futurity and of everything that lies beyond human ken. Now here the word ken means understanding. And he informed me that he had, quote, pretty much made up his mind to be annihilated. But still he does not seem to rest until he gets hold of a definite belief. Hawthorne continues, he can neither believe nor be comfortable in his unbelief, 
and he is too honest and courageous not to try to do one or the other. If he were a religious man, he would be one of the most truly religious and reverential. He has a very high and noble nature, and better worth immortality than most of us. From my reading of a uh, biography of Hawthorne, Hawthorne recollects Melville uh, and he, uh, Hawthorne, had gone out to the sand dunes uh, where they lived near the coast and uh, would sit up in the sand dunes smoking cigars uh, and discussing uh, literature, fate, providence, uh, heaven and hell and so forth. And it drew, uh, or I said, I should say, it um, it made Sophia, uh, it, it drove her mad because of all the cigar smoke from the gentleman. But you see here, uh, Melville, a sort of tortured uh, and rather uh, melancholy individual. One of the key issues and key themes or tropes in Melville's work is the concept of a protagonist who is attempting to escape civilization. And this is certainly a theme not unique to Melville. We see it in so many of our American writers. And the critic who really brings this to the fore is Leslie Fiedler in his novel, Love and Death uh, in the American Novel. Henry Nash Smith does it as well in Virgin Land. Uh, this idea that our authors uh, as artists have characters who are seeking uh, to escape uh, the confines and the demands uh, of society. And so we see writers like James Fenimore Cooper uh, doing it in his leather stocking tales. We see it in Mark Twain and uh, the adventures uh, or adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Uh, we see it uh, in Melville. We see it in Hemingway. We see it in Fitzgerald. Uh, if you think of Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby. Uh, so Melville's not alone in this. But uh, what Melville and these others uh, were doing were had characters who were seeking ways of escaping the complexities, the anxieties of modern society. The sea for many of his characters, promises this kind of escape, uh, a way to evade and to have sort of some kind of, of fraternal bonds uh, aboard the self-contained world of the ship. So several of his characters attempt such withdrawal, even as they reside in cities like New York. And as you read Bartleby, we can read Bartleby as one such character, because Bartleby can be read as a story of escape, not only for Bartleby, but also for the narrator. The narrator chooses to live alone and be friendless and to work rather unambitiously in the sterile work of copying, because this is what a Scrivener is. Long before we had Xerox copy machines, any sort of important document like a deed or a will uh, and uh, legal documents uh, documents that needed to be in multiple form for various interested parties had to be copied by hand. And so this is what a scrivener, a scrivener's job was. In other words, a scribe. So they were charged with transcribing these documents, uh, copying them so that each copy uh, could go to, again, uh, an interested party in whatever the legal matter may be. So Bartleby's detachment is more complete and perhaps more honest as his passive resistance on page 1536 and his motionless existence, existence holds no pretense or apology. Another key issue that we see in much of Melville's work is the theme of the individual versus authority. So questions of authority concern most of the fiction that we have uh, in our textbook that belongs to Melville. If we look at Bartleby the Scrivener and we consider the narrator of Bartleby as an authority figure, 
How does he respond to Bartleby's passive resistance? He's infuriated by it, isn't he? So one way to approach Bartleby is as a response to Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance, which we've read. So the minor characters, characters, the office workers like Turkey, Nippers, and Ginger Nut, they may represent ways society responds to the nonconformist. And if you think about how each of these characters respond and react to Bartleby's refusal to do his appointed work, we can see that these characters are sort of symbolic of how society responds to the nonconformist. We think the nonconformist is insane or mad or that perhaps what they need to be, uh, what needs to happen is that they need to be thrown in jail or that they need to be beaten into submission. And so Melville writes on page 1149, Quote, nothing so aggravates an earnest person as a passive resistance. And just as Ahab, who is the key protagonist in Moby Dick, remember Ahab is the one who's chasing the white whale, who has, uh, right, uh, who has taken his leg. He's got the peg leg. And so he's uh, piloting this whale ship and he is in a mad search to seek out and take revenge on Moby Dick. So just as Mahab's Ahab's monomania, there's a word you should know. Monomania means uh, to be a sing, to be obsessed, to be singularly fixated on one single idea. And Melville was uh, very intrigued by characters who who were monomaniacs, as was Hawthorne. So just as Ahab's monomania, that desire to seek out revenge, leads to his destruction. Bartleby's does as well, because Bartleby is a monomaniac as well. It's quite interesting to me that on the one hand, we have Ahab, whose monomania leads him to through all of this um, adventure and action and motion and chasing Moby Dick. There's all this physical energy as he chases this idea of revenge. And on the other hand, Melville gives us this character, Bartleby, who is just as singularly obsessed with the idea of doing nothing. But his monomania results in him doing the opposite of Ahab, behaving completely differently, right? He doesn't do anything. And in fact, what we witness as we watch uh, Bartleby uh throughout the story is we we essentially watch him shut down don't we he withdraws further and further from society and from himself and from life until we find him in his final state at the end and i won't give that away Another thing to be on the lookout for as you read uh, Bartleby the Scrivener is uh, another theme that we see in some of Melville's work, uh, a certain suspicion, a certain skepticism and critique of uh, the economic uh, model known as economic system known as capitalism. Melville uh, repeatedly appears suspicious of capitalism as an economic enterprise, uh, we can see that, uh, and don't lose sight of this, if you look at uh, Bartleby the Scrivener and where it is set, and the, really the subtitle of the story, Melville tells us that this is a story of Wall Street. And of course, Wall Street represents, and in fact is the economic epicenter, isn't it? of uh, the American economy. So Bartleby can considered really an anti-industrial or an anti-capitalist uh, text. There's a strong sense that the Scriveners, that you know, Nippers and Ginger and um, Turkey and Bartleby and the narrator, in fact, 
even though he's the lawyer, there's this foreboding sense that all these characters have lost their vitality, in part because of the work that they do. Their hearts have become hardened. They become dehumanized. And uh, if you think about their work, they don't really produce anything, do they? They copy over and over and over again. The setting in Bartleby, likewise, suggests an environment that is dehumanizing because of all of the enclosures. From the windows in the office, the workers can only see walls. The setting uh, implies a sealing off of individual from individual, an elimination of distractions so that work can rapidly progress and higher profits can be made. If you don't think this is the case, look at most any uh, current modern day office space that is full of these things known as, uh, oh, what do they call of these things? You know, cubbies um, and... Um, Oh, I'm blanking on the um, the term for these cubicles. That's the word I was looking for. Right. Uh, we are surrounded by cubicle blinders and dividers so that we're not distracted, so that we only focus on the computer terminal, so that we don't daydream, that we don't socialize, that we only focus at the task uh, on the task at hand. One approach to this story, and this is this is the way that I read Bartleby the Scrivener, the one that makes the most sense to me, and that is to read the story as Melville's artistic statement, one that expresses Melville's rise and fall as a, quote, successful writer. When Moby Dick was published, critics did not know what to think of it because it did not follow the same commercial formula or the pattern of his first four sea adventure novels. Moby Dick in so many ways defies categorization because it weaves history, natural science, philosophy, theology, drama, and poetry. It's truly an innovative and experimental novel. Simply put, I see Bartleby as an extension of Melville, because each man refers not to copy. As Bartleby says at one point, I have given up on copying, right? Think about that. As an artist, Melville simply could not keep copying the same book over and over again. And sadly, that's what the readers want. Sadly, that's what the critics want, don't they? They want more of the same thing that they have enjoyed from an artist in the past. But true artists don't do that. True artists grow and experiment. They evolve, right? They begin to push the boundaries and become more and more innovative. Real artists do this. You know, I'm not talking about the run of the mill uh, a pop artist. I'm talking about, you know, the, the real avant garde artists. This is the way that I uh, treat Bartleby, the way I read it, the way I best understand and can empathize and sympathize with Bartleby as a character who would rather die alone than continue to live a life that is not at all fruitful or rewarding. And I failed to mention this a few slides ago, but, you know, there are connections to be made not only to Emerson here, but also to Thoreau. Uh, if you think about the characters uh, who work in this office, don't they sort of live a life that, as Thoreau would characterize it in uh, in Walden, when he says that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation, right? They live lives that are, that are uh, uh, tied to conformity and tradition and pattern, and they truly do not realize their full potential. 
right? Because they are doing what they think society expects of them to do. And so we see these characters in the office who, I mean, this is why the narrator, for God's sakes, has to employ two Scriveners, right? He has to employ Turkey and um, uh, and Ginger, isn't it? Um, the two characters to get one day's work out of them, right? One is Nippers in the morning and Turkey in the afternoon. Uh, one of those is on during the morning and off during the others. Uh, this shows how capitalism and how these uh, lives that these um, characters live have dehumanized them uh, in such a, uh, a tragic way. I hope you like the story. I'll end with this. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not point out that Despite the darkness uh, and the melancholy tone of a story like Bartleby the Scrivener, uh, and again, you know, Melville and Hawthorne and Poe, uh, those three authors off the top of my head are the ones uh, who are typically called dark romantics because they view human, the human condition and uh, the human experience through a different prism. Uh, one that is full of shadows uh, uh, and supernatural uh, activity in a way that um, uh, the light romantics didn't. But there's humor in Melville. You've got to pay attention and be on the lookout for it, but it's there. So, uh, But like Hawthorne and Poe, there's not much humor in Melville, but occasionally there is some. It's dry. It's a subtle humor. In Bartleby, turkey, nippers, ginger nut, and Mr. Cutlets resemble characters from a tall tale. Furthermore, several scenes are humorous, like Bartleby's denying the narrator access to his office on that Sunday morning, and the worker's use of the word prefer. My favorite, though, is Bartleby's insistence to the narrator that he, quote, is not particular, as the narrator offers him a litany of opportunities with respect to um, career choices and uh, career advice. <laughs> he keeps saying, no, I, would, I, I wouldn't rather do that. No, I wouldn't want to be a clerk. No, I wouldn't want to do this. And then he says, but I'm not particular. Right? So there is, there's humor there, but you, you know, you've got to be on the lookout for it. So uh, anyways, I hope you all are well. And um, we'll, t we'll talk soon, I hope. I hope we'll see one another.